Welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. We believe life is about how we react. Welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes Podcast. This episode is brought to you in part by Briata Pharmaceuticals. Sean, I heard you had a little day off recently. How'd that go? It is rare for me to have a Saturday off. This yeah. is unlikely, right? Actually, to be fair, when I take a Saturday off, it's because I'm traveling, right? So I should mm-hmm. say, it's rare to have a Saturday off for no reason, just to be home. So yeah. a good friend of mine and his family live in Sonoma, which is the heart of the wine country, right? Or, you know, every city out there is the heart of the wine country, it seems. So right in the middle of it, we have the text about a week prior, and he was like, dude, you should come out and have wine or something someday. I'm like, oh, hey, what are you guys doing next Saturday? So, of course, he was like, let's make it happen. Umberto used to work with me on the training team. We we still work for the same company. He's just in a different role now. He's got four little kids, and I was with his wife, Margarita. They're amazing uh, people, and I've met them here and there, but I've never really hung out with the family. So my Saturday off, I drove out to the wine country, met Umberto and his family, We went to a vineyard that is kid-friendly and had food, and we just hung out on the grass and made paper airplanes with the little ones. We drank lots of different wines. We tasted all kinds of cheese, and we just had a wonderful day, relaxing literally all day, and it was so much fun. Awesome. It, It sounds like a dream. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, everything about it. The weather was perfect. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's early fall, so not too hot, certainly not too cold. You could not ask for a better day. And I just had a blast hanging out with the little ones, too. And, yeah, it was just it was a good day. Wonderful. I love that. Not only did I have a Saturday off, but it was a part of a three-day weekend for me. So... You know, sometimes I don't do things like that because I feel like I have too much to do. Like, I need to stay home and be productive. But it was almost a free day to be able to do that and still get my regular two days off at home so I can do laundry and yeah. podcasts and whatever else comes with life. So, yeah, it, it, it was a dream. And now I'm paying for it because now I feel like I have a lot to do today. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you say it was worth it, though? Oh, absolutely worth it. Something I'll add, too, about Numberto, he's an avid listener. You know, mm. I would say he's not really connected to the rare disease world. Or at least, he wasn't until more recently, but he's right. been listening since I've met him. Um, and he's just, it's fun to get a text every now and then and be like, oh, I love yeah. that story or you know, something about the podcast. And I'm just thrilled that he listens and uh, shares life with me in that aspect. Appreciate you, Umberto. I think another reason why it's it was a dream, it's, it's perfect weather right now. I love early fall. I love spring. You know, it's. You get a little bit of beautiful colors out in the fields and the hills, a little crisp air in the mornings and evenings, and yeah. it's just perfect. Talk about good weather. What's it been like for you on the East Coast? Well, it's getting chilly, but we had a random 80-degree day on a Saturday. It was wow. amazing, and I went out for a ride And it was so perfect because, first of all, it was warm. Second of all, all the leaves are changing right now. And it was just beautiful. And you don't normally get to experience that in the comfort of the sunshine. It's Mm. usually pretty chilly out when the leaves start changing. So it was just an incredible day to be out on the bike trail. Do you hit the bike trail when it's raining? 
No, not usually. I mean, I used to when I was a lot younger, but, we're, you know, as we discuss sometimes, we're not young men anymore. <laughs> and uh, I'm kind of a fair-weather cyclist now. All right, fair enough. Sean, I've got the quote of the week here for you. It's pretty short and to the point. A problem solved. No. Wow. <laughs> a problem... <laughs> <laughs> Done. Problem <laughs> solved. No. A problem well stated is a problem half solved. Mm. And that's by John Dewey. And I love it because usually half the problem is trying to figure out what the problem is, right? Yep. You know, if we can really understand a problem, I think that gets us a long way to the solution. One more time. A problem well stated is a problem half solved. And that's the quote of the week. Thank you, Kyle. I like it. In today's interview, we're going to bring clarity to a problem that comes up often on this show and is common in the world of disability. As we all know, folks with disabilities face all kinds of barriers when traveling. One of those happens to be damage to mobility devices, specifically when traveling by airplane. Zach Victor is a travel journalist with USA Today, and he's working on a project that calls attention to that very problem. But one more thing before we get into that interview. The following message is brought to you by Riata Pharmaceuticals. Hey, Kyle, you would say that there's no time like the present, right? Yeah, of course. And? Well, you know, like, now is the time. Be in the now. The moment <laughs> is now. Yeah, I would say focusing on the now is pretty important. But what are you getting at? I'm glad you asked. I just want to let our community know that Sky Claris Omavaloxalon 50 milligram capsules is now available. Ah, uh, of course. The first and only FDA approved prescription medicine for Friedrich ataxia in patients 16 years and older is now available. So if you or a loved one has FA, be sure to talk to your doctor to see if Sky Claris is right for you. Now, dude. The time is now. And to stay updated on all things Sky Claris, visit SkyClaris.com. Before taking Sky Claris, tell your healthcare provider about your medical conditions and medicines you take. Sky Claris may cause serious side effects, including an increase in liver enzymes in your blood. Increase in a blood protein which tells how well your heart is working and changes in cholesterol levels. Your doctor will test these levels before and during treatment with Skyclaris. The most common side effects of Skyclaris include increased liver enzymes, headache, nausea, stomach pain, tiredness, diarrhea, and muscle pain. Call your doctor if you have any side effects. For additional information about Skyclaris, please see the full prescribing information and patient product information at www.skyclaris.com. This ad was brought to you by Riata Pharmaceuticals. Well, through some investigative uh, storytelling, Zach's project is helping move the needle in the world of travel for folks living with a disability. Zach, welcome to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. We've been looking forward to having you today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation too. You're a bit of a famous individual right now in the rare disease community. Um, and I don't know why I say right now because I'm new to you. Maybe you've been <laughs> famous for a long time. I don't know. Um <laughs> But can you, I don't know, in your own words, tell us uh, what you're doing. What's put you on the radar for people like me in the disability world? Yeah, happy to. Thanks again for having me on and for asking me about all this. So 
probably the reason that you're familiar with me right now is because I've been working on a project over the course of 2023 tracking incidents of airlines damaging mobility devices. You know, you and your listeners, I'm sure, know, and I have been learning over the course of this project just how big a problem that is. I mean, we're talking 10 to 15,000 wheelchairs and other mobility devices a year or more that are damaged or destroyed by airlines when disabled travelers are flying places. And so as an airline reporter, I was pretty familiar with the statistics. You know, the Department of Transportation releases numbers about mobility device damage by airlines every month. And so I saw these numbers and also have some personal experience with it that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, But I saw these numbers and I was like, this is obviously a huge problem, but I don't think that it's something that gets a lot of attention in the mainstream press. I write for USA Today. Um, And really, the whole idea behind this project was just to put a face on these numbers. Like you can see 10,000, 15,000 mobility devices on a page. I really wanted to talk to the people who it was happening to um, and show why these stories are so important. And so that's what I've been doing. I have not spoken to nearly 10,000 people. I haven't even spoken to 50 people yet this year. I think right now the project is hovering around 30 or 40 responses that I've gotten over the course of the year. But I mean, think about that. We're in, we're just heading into November. And so over the course of almost the full year, I've talked to 30 plus people who have had their devices damaged. And that's a small fraction of the number that have actually experienced this. But I've heard their stories and like, it really disrupts their life. Again, you don't need to hear this from me. You know this, but that's what I've been working on. Really just trying to tell your stories and put a human face on this huge issue. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, it's it's been, it's been powerful to read the stories and to get an idea of just how disruptive this is. At some level, especially if you're, you know, three or four degrees removed from disability, you might hear the number 10 to 15,000 wheelchairs are, you know, or devices are damaged throughout the course of a year. But when you think about the, I don't know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people that travel, that number can seem really small. Right. In your experience, uh, whether meeting or talking to people, interviewing, can you give us an idea of why ten to 15,000 is such a big deal? Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about the other reason that I'm doing this project, which is that one of my cousins has cerebral palsy. Um, and we were traveling together a few years ago, and the airline left his wheelchair uh, at his home city. And so we got Jeez. to this international destination where we were all going as a family uh, and his wheelchair was not there. So obviously that isn't exactly wow. damage, but it was just as disruptive for Same a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we had to we had to like find a rental wheelchair for him that really didn't fit him. Um, and it was disruptive both to him and also to everyone because we all kind of had to adjust what we were doing on this vacation together to accommodate mm. the fact that this airline forgot that his wheelchair was there. And so I do have a little bit of, I guess, secondary experience seeing how issues like this can affect not just a person, but also their caregivers. So that was part of it. But also, like you said, the airlines that I've talked to over the course of this project try to emphasize, you know, 10 to 15,000 people whose devices are damaged represents about 1.5% of the total number of devices that they carry in a year. And if you think about it that way on paper, like you said, it seems very small. But everyone who I've talked to for this project has said some version of, imagine if airlines broke the legs of 1.5% of their passengers. And you mm-hmm. like had no idea if it was going to be you on this flight. You might just be that 1.5% of people who you get to your destination and they break your legs as you're coming off the plane. And so sure, in aggregate, 1.5% is a small number in the scheme of things, right? But the individual impact of each of these incidents is huge. I mean, it can mean that the person loses out on work. It can mean that they might be homebound. I mean, we, you know, we've seen stories of people who literally died because of this damage. That's why these stories are so important to tell, right? Because yeah. you think on paper, oh, sure, 1.5% of people, their wheelchair might get damaged or whatever, and then it gets repaired. The airlines have a process for that. 
And what I've also learned over the course of this project is, yes, every airline does have some sort of process in place to deal with it, but that doesn't mean that it happens smoothly or quickly. And Mm -hmm. someone who experiences this damage themselves, and maybe you guys have both experienced this yourselves, like you could be out of commission for months or a year or more just waiting for the repairs or replacement to happen. And so, sure, on a statistical level, it's a small number, but on an individual level, this is a humongous problem um, and really disrupts the lives of the people that it happens to in a way that I don't think airlines would stand for if, again, it was just like a non-disabled person's legs being broken at the end of their flight. (laughs) Absolutely. That's a really powerful analogy. Yeah. You know, th- that's just sets even with me a little bit differently than thinking about 10,000 walkers or wheelchairs. Right. Know? Exactly. It seems like a tiny fraction, but to the person that it happens to, it's their whole world. Right. Exactly. And it isn't even like you're losing someone's suitcase, right? I mean, many people have had that experience where their suitcase gets left behind and maybe that means they're they get to their vacation and the clothes that they had packed aren't available to them like if that happens yes it's extremely frustrating but chances are you're going somewhere that you'll be able to buy new clothes off the rack if your wheelchair is destroyed by an airline that's not an off the rack device in most cases it's fitted to the user again you and your listeners all know this but these are all things that i've been learning and this is part of why i'm doing this project because I don't think a lot of people who aren't in the disabled or rare disease community realize just how significant an impact this damage can have on the person that it happens to. You can buy a new set of clothes, but you can't just go out and buy a $60,000 wheelchair. Exactly. (laughs) So, Zach, through your investigation and just hearing stories what's the goal? Like, I don't know, maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but I'm just... Like, okay, so 1.5% of stuff is damaged or broken. Is the goal to get that number lower or to eliminate the problem altogether? Or how? what what are we looking at here? Sure. So I guess that kind of depends who you ask, right? I think like okay. Um, certainly the advocacy community wants to get it down to zero. And I think like in an ideal world, the airlines also don't want to damage people's wheelchairs or mobility devices. And so I think overall, it is a goal and sort of um, what people are reaching towards to try to get it down to zero for everyone. Like there shouldn't be damage. There shouldn't be these devices destroyed. I think realistically speaking, for as long as wheelchairs are going to have to be transported in the cargo hold, there will be some, like some amount of damage. I mean, in the same way, that your suitcase might lose a wheel. You know, there's lots of moving parts when it comes to planes. You might be on a rough flight. Like there are all kinds of factors that go into the kinds of damage that we see. So in a more immediate sense, what a lot of the people I've spoken to over the course of this project are really asking for is just better training, Um, saying that a lot of the damage that occurs happens because of unfamiliar baggage handlers who either haven't been trained on how to handle their devices properly or don't have the equipment available to them like lifts or that kind of thing to actually get it onto the plane in an appropriate way. And so I think that's probably the first step is just improving the training regimen for the people who actually work at the airports and may um, have to interact with these devices. Part of what I've heard over the course of this project, which is a complicating factor, is that baggage handlers tend to be a fairly high turnover job, especially if they're not Mm. working directly for the airlines. In smaller airports, they may be contractors who work for the airports, may not be unionized, that kind of thing. And so part of the problem with improving training is the cadence of that training to keep up with the turnover can be really difficult. Um, And so another thing that people have really been looking at is the prototype that Delta Flight Products put out in the spring for in-cabin wheelchair securement. And I think that for a lot of folks, both on the airline side and on the advocacy side, that's a really important step. Um, So that is, I'm sure, again, you and your listeners have seen this. It's a prototype for a place. It's a seat 
that can be kind of folded away and then has the Q strength system to keep power chairs in place in the airplane cabin. And that's something that the airline is also driving towards. But obviously, airplanes fly for decades after they've been purchased. They may not have their cabins refit every, like less than every 10 years or so. So that kind of solution also takes a long time to roll out. Um, but it does seem like something that's on the horizon. And then more in the interim, um, I had an article a couple of weeks ago about United said that it would be um, publishing cargo hold door dimensions for all of its aircraft on its website. And ideally, I think they said kind of down the road, you should be able to put your wheelchair dimensions in when you're booking if you request accessible services, and then it will help you find the planes that can most easily accommodate your device. Um, If there's a certain aircraft whose cargo hold isn't big enough to actually let your chair get into the cargo hold, um, they'll point you towards other itineraries that may be better able to accommodate the specific needs of the traveler. And so there isn't one single solution that everyone is working towards. This is really a multi-pronged effort across all different aspects of both the industry and the advocacy community. Um, And I'm keeping my eye on it just like you are. I'm not exactly sure where we're going, but there are certainly multiple balls in the air. And I'm kind of hopeful that this project and the work of advocates are helping move the needle a little bit. And there there's another, not solution, but a part of the problem is there's no recognition that anything is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of it. Like, I had my chair damaged one time to the point where the airline replaced it. But in the moment when they gave it back to me at the uh, jetway, there was zero recognition that anything was wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And then I started driving away and I heard a rattling and, you know, and then I discovered. But just the recognition, the I'm sorry that this happened. There is none of that happening. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing that's come up a lot is I think that sort of goes back to the training aspect, right? Like a lot of the people who you interact with at the airport probably don't realize how big a deal it is when this damage occurs. Like they think in their minds that it's similar to a damaged suitcase because it It's treated like luggage, right? It's whole, it's loaded with the luggage. It's put in the same area of the plane. If it's not a manual chair that you can fold up and put in the cabin um, closet. And so I think that that also goes back to the training aspect. It's not just training on how to physically handle the devices. It's also training um, on how to interact with customers when something does go wrong. And again, that's something that's come up in this project over and over. Like, there isn't a good understanding among airline and airport employees um, about how significant this is when it does happen. I know we aren't necessarily here to pick on airlines, (laughs) but (laughs) there is not, there doesn't seem to be another side of the coin. You know, you were talking about the chairs being down the cargo hold. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty common, especially right now and for the foreseeable future, it's going to be that way. But I'm convinced I've never been in a cargo area. I don't know anything about planes, but even in the cargo hold, there has to be a way to strap down chairs and to, I don't know, maybe cage them so other things don't fall on them or roll into them or whatever when things move around. I just... I think about, I think Kelly, whoever the CEO of Southwest is, I'm forgetting his name right now, but Ed Bastian in charge of Delta. I I feel like if if somebody close to them, maybe a child, had a, a mobility device, no matter if they had to fly commercial on their plane, I'm willing to bet they would find a way to make sure their device is functional when they land. You said airlines don't want to damage wheelchairs, and I think to Kyle's point, when airlines don't say sorry, and or people that work represent the airlines don't say sorry, I just have a hard time understanding or 
or seeing that is a priority for any airline, not just the the names we've mentioned so far. Yeah. I, I could mean, be wrong, but yeah. I mean, look, I I can't speak to the airline sort of business of course. like dynamics or what's going on there. I can say that for each one of these stories that I've worked on, I reach out to the airline every time. Um, and I mean, if we're being totally honest, right, it's bad business for them to have to deal sure. with these incidents. And so I genuinely believe airlines when they say that they don't want to damage these wheelchairs. I don't sure. think that it like is good for them or their passengers or their business or like all of the social media blow ups that we see when this happens. But I think we have seen in the statistics show that there is a number like we've talked about 10 to 15,000 wheelchairs a year that get damaged by U S airlines. And so it is a question. And again, something that I hope that this project helps move the ball on a little bit. Like it is a question about what sorts of resources they're putting into addressing that problem. I don't, Mm -hmm. I can't say for sure what they're doing um, other than some of those steps that United recently announced that I reported on. But I think that highlighting these stories is sort of the work that I can do to help bring this to people's attention. And I hope that it gets the attention of the people who have the power to make some changes. You're absolutely, and like I said, I'm not here to pick on them, but where would we all be if we couldn't fly somewhere, right? Um, Right. (laughs) Air travel is definitely a game changer in life. You mentioned reaching out to airlines every time you run a story and I was thinking about our connection. You did a story on me a while back. Mm-hmm. You know, my walker was left behind at my starting city, and it was damaged. Well, we by all time, heard about that <laughs> by the time we got it right. Yeah. Um, so, in that article, you would, I saw that you reached out to Southwest, and they gave a a reply. And. In doing that, with these 30 or 40 stories that you've run or individuals that you've talked to, overall, what do you, what's your sense on the airline's response? Like, I don't know, do mm. people hate you because you're calling attention to it? Or are they grateful that you're helping move them? Like, generally speaking, what would you say the feel is from the airline industry? Sure. Um, so I think... It's a little hard to tell because, you know, I'm working with the press offices there. And so any statement that I get comes through the press officers. I'm not talking to the people who are making these business decisions directly in most sure. of the cases, if and uh, probably not any of the cases. I will say that airlines, my impression is that airlines know this is a problem, right? Like mm. they're aware it's not yeah. something that they're happy with, right? They don't like want this to be happening. So my impression is basically like they are also looking for solutions, but sort of relying on advocates to tell them what those solutions are. And then, you know, airlines are big businesses. It takes a long time for solutions of any kind in any avenue, not just accessibility, but really any sort of change at airlines can happen pretty slowly. And so- The first step is figuring out what the solutions are. The next step is figuring out how to implement those solutions. And so I hear a lot from the airlines about, you know, working with different people to figure out the solutions. I think that they're like, this is an issue that probably has not been on their radar as much as it should be. Uh, If it were, probably the numbers would be lower. And so I think that they're still in the finding solutions phase and not so much in the implementation phase. And again, this is that's broad strokes. Different airlines are doing different things. Right. Like I said, United had that recent announcement. Um, There are all kind like work is being done. It's just we don't get to see it until it's public. And so it can be hard to say kind of what pace it's happening at or sort of what is being worked on until they're ready to go public with that information. You know, you talk about the bureaucracy of things changing. It just takes time for any right. large corporation. So I do right. wonder, like, when they decide to switch 
cookies or, you know, to go from peanuts to pretzels. <laughs> like, how long did that process take? Yeah, I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, this is a, it's funny because I was just doing some reporting about new food on Delta Airlines. And so they, Delta recently updated its first class domestic menu. Um, and I was just talking to some of their executives towards the end of October about this. And they said for the menu, for the new menu that rolled out in September, they started development on that in April. And so it oh, could, wow. like even just to update the food menu takes like nine months or so. And so if yeah. you think about something like that Jeez. in-cabin wheelchair securement uh, prototype, that sort of thing, ha like food doesn't have to be certified by the FAA. The, sure. the, the in-cabin wheelchair securement does. It has to be crash tested. It has to be actually manufactured, rolled out onto the plane. And so that kind of thing can take a number of years as opposed to a number of right. months just because there are so many more steps involved in getting it actually certified to use and then physically onto the plane. And so I think like the food comparison is a good one because even that small change takes months of workshopping and taste yeah. testing and, you know, giving it to some of the most loyal flyers to see what they think and tweaking the recipes and going back and forth. And that is isn't something that needs government approval. And so sure. for any kind of accessibility solution that probably would get into a regulatory question and then that just adds a whole layer of complexity of course. but they are working on it you know i don't want to be totally doom and gloom you mentioned that they need us to help them come up with solutions or even tell them what the solution is right <laughs> and i think that's a really important thing to realize like they could think this is an important issue all they want. But unless we help them come up with the solutions, the answers, the stories that of how it affects our lives and how they might be able to solve it, it nothing's going to get done unless we step in to play that role. Right. And I will say many, if not all of the airlines have some kind of internal mechanism for getting that feedback, whether it's working with their own disabled employees to like solicit solutions, or if they have some kind of external board that includes advocates and others advising them on accessibility issues. So it is on like most, if not all of the airlines I've spoken to's radars. Like this is something that they do want to work on. They are, um, giving some resources to addressing these issues. But again, it's hard to roll them out. That doesn't mean that they're not open to feedback. We just don't always get to see yeah. exactly what the mechanism is. Do you happen to know, uh, or would you recommend a uh, place for feedback? You know, you talk about the Department of Transportation. They, you know, you can do some reporting with them. Um, are there other resources a listener might explore if they wanted to offer some input? Yeah, that's a great question. So DOT reporting is obviously one way, like you said. Um, I would say, you know, a lot of airlines will solicit customer feedback through surveys or something after your mm -hmm. flight. So that's certainly one way to get in touch with the airline directly. If you receive one of those surveys, fill it out. Like, they may not do anything with it directly, but sort of the aggregate of data, if more people fill those out and talk about these issues, that will show up in their data collection. And then, obviously, advocacy organizations like All Wheels Up, Paralyzed Veterans for America, those kinds of groups really have the ears of these airline executives and also of legislators. And so talking to them, getting involved in their efforts can be a way to have more of a direct impact. Well, Zach, tell us a little bit more about you and the work you do. How long have you been with USA today? How did you get into this line of work? And so on. Sure. So I'm a consumer travel reporter at USA Today. I've been here about a year and a half now. Um, but I've been covering airlines and aviation on and off since 2017. So I worked uh, reporting on airlines at uh, the New York Times, and then I was at the Point Sky for a while. And then during the pandemic, I came yeah. off this beat for a bit when fewer people were traveling. Um, sure. But I've always been really interested in 
travel and transportation. And so uh, I went to school for journalism. And when I was able to kind of like needle my way into <laughs> reporting about the airlines when I was at the New York Times, I realized that I had kind of found my beat. Uh, and it's something that I really, really enjoy doing. Well, Zach, thank you so much for coming on and uh, talking to us a little bit about your project. Of course, thank you for shedding a little more light on the topic through your writing. And of course, um, interviews such as this one. So we appreciate your time and the energy that you're uh, investing in this particular one and a half percent issue. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Like I said at the beginning, I think these are really important stories to be told. I don't think that people outside of the disability uh, and rare disease community have a good understanding of this stuff. And so, you know, happy to talk about it and also happy to promote the project. I would say to your listeners, if this happens to you, check out USA Today's website. Please fill out my form. Reach out to me. I want to hear and tell your story. And we'll be sure to link that in our show notes, so easy to find there for our listeners. Again, Zach, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Zach. Thanks again. Kyle, I interviewed with Zach about two months ago. We were on, you know, opposite positions. He was asking me questions about my trip to Vegas right. and the yeah. lost walker and blah, blah, blah. I got the impression then, and today it was just confirmed. The dude's legit. He is a yeah. professional, well-spoken, everything about it. He's, he's very fine-tuned in the way he does things. So yeah, uh, I enjoyed that conversation. Of course, I love that he's calling attention to an area that you, me, many of our listeners have been on the side of that problem you never want to find yourself on. I was thinking during the conversation, I was like, I'm glad this is the guy that is helping, you know, address this problem. He does a really good job. You know, I like that Zach said, you know, there's no easy fix, right? We're not going to fix it tomorrow. But the hope is conversations that we have, you know, articles that he writes, uh, what other people are doing, all wheels up. He mentioned all these different entities poking away and chipping away at the problem. The hope is that somewhere not too far down the road, we begin to see a lot of changes that benefit everybody, including the airline and people like us. Yeah, I think it all starts with people talking about it, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Let's wrap this up like we always do with a bit of gratitude. As we do at the end of every episode, we find value in expressing some appreciation. So, Kyle... Who are you saying a thank you to today? My thank you note goes out to our friend, Mary Carissa. We've had her on the podcast before actually talking about accessible flights and accessible travel. We had the Farrah Energy Ball a few weeks ago, and it's a big fundraiser for the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. And one of the... One of the packages in the silent auction was a cookie of the month club from Mary. So Hmm. you could bid on this and Mary sends you a batch of cookies once a month for a year. Wow. And it was the most bid on item at the whole ball. No way. I think it ended up going for $2,000. You could have cookies from Mary every month. So I just think that's an inventive thing to do. And also it occurs to me that people aren't buying cookies. You know, they're buying a little bit of of Mary's attention and and her love that she puts into it. And they know who she is and about her and her contribution to the community. So I just really appreciate Mary for doing that. 
and just for being who she is. What an incredible gift that keeps giving, right? You know, whoever bid, I'm sure they were prepared to give two grand. No right. matter what, no matter what, you know, they were just going to yeah. write a check. But now, for the next 12 months, cookies are going to show up in their mailbox. And <laughs> you, you don't yeah. get that all the time. So that's really cool. Also, I want to add from personal experience, Mary's cookies are pretty bomb. I agree. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say thank you today to Umberto and his family for not only an amazing day off, but for treating me. Uh, they, it was very hard to pay for anything while we were enjoying our day yesterday. So I just appreciate the kind of people that you can just be free with, right? In terms of relax, there was no obligation on their part or my part to be a certain, you know, put on a show or you know to behave yeah. a certain way. Yeah, we just we all felt very comfortable making fun of each other and uh, <laughs> playing with the kids and yeah. not really worried about how we sound or what we look like or, you know, all that stuff. When when you're a new friend or you're kind of early on in those stages, there's, I imagine even for them, there's a lot of pressure to make sure their kids are behaving and yeah, representing yeah. their family well. But, A, they're well-behaved kids naturally. And B, it was just a, a rewarding day. So, Umberto and Margarita, thank you for such a phenomenal day. Well, will say thank you again to Zach for carving out some time to be on the show today. This episode has been brought to you in part by Riata Pharmaceuticals. Be sure to visit our show notes where you can find a link to Zach's story on our friend and fellow rare disease patient Nina Nazar. A very well-written story about Nina's experience and how damage to wheelchairs impacts the family. At the end of that story, you'll find the form to submit your own airline travel story if you like. We appreciate you listening to the show and being a part of this journey with us. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please be sure to share the show with your friends or on your social media platforms. We'd also appreciate it if you take a moment and write a review. We look forward to talking to you next week. Until then, keep living with urgency. Thank you for listening to the Two Disabled Dudes podcast. This show is possible with your support. Visit twodisableddudes.com to donate. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app.